sure it's my pleasure to welcome you to the last in this series of Simon's lectures. Um, there was a ballot held, and I was afraid I was the only one who voted, or I was happy to vote. <laughs> but it seems that I wasn't the only one who voted. Well. So, um, I'd like to present the singer who's going to talk to us about duality. <clears throat> David even cracked that natu naturally after S-duality, what could come but T-duality? Yeah. And Han asked me whether there were any others. Right, exactly. There is something called U-duality. You got to invite me back and I'll be, I'll be happy to come. Uh, what I want to do today is give a very simple example of T-duality uh, for two reasons. One, it will reinforce uh, what I did with S-duality and abelian gauge theory where I could actually compute. That's what I'll do today. The other reason is that um, I frequently at the end of a lecture use a lot of buzzwords, whatever the present day cliches are, and I wanted to have something very concrete and specific to hang those conjectures on, and this simple example will do that. So I'll start with uh, a statement of what I mean by T-duality. Uh, one says theory A is T-dual to theory B if A compact on a, on a space with large volume is T-dual to B compactified on a space with small volume. Now, compactified on means we're thinking of these string theories these are maps of a loop, or really a moving loop, so a map of a torus or a cylinder into a target space, and compactified on means that instead of mapping into a 9-1 space, Minkowski 9-1, you take one of the uh, real coordinates, space coordinates, and make it into a circle instead. So the statement is that a type 2A string, whatever that means, I'll wave my hand later on, compactified on this space with a circle of radius R, I shouldn't have used R because R stands for Euclidean for the reals, um, is the same as the type 2 theory compactified on a circle of radius 1 over R. That's what T-duality does. It changes the volume of 1 into the reciprocal volume. Now, of course, we don't understand what these things are, so I'm just going to erase all this and talk about strings with values in the circle. Just forget about all the rest of the space with, and show you its relation to strings uh, compactified on a circle of one over the radius. In this construction, I will need the Poisson summation formula, and I'll need the special case which is what happens if you sum over e to the minus c x squared, but for x an integer <clears throat> to the dual lattice. Uh, well, at any rate, this is the sum. This is a special case of the Poisson summation formula. <clears throat> for any function, we have to use e to the minus x squared or e to the minus c x squared, where f hat is the Fourier transform of the original function. And also, it's worth noting that this is really uh, a special case that works for any closed subgroup of a locally compact abelian group. Then the integral of a function over the subgroup is the same as a Fourier transform over the character group. Uh, g mod h, with the measures, the harm measures normalized properly. If L is a lattice, the special case of some interest, is if L is a lattice in Rn, think of the lattice in a maximal abelian subgroup, subalgebra of uh, semi-simple Lie algebra, uh, what we had called the, uh, we'd identified 
with the magnetic charge. <coughs> then a big lattice, meaning full so that the quotient is compact. Then this is the dual lattice, which would correspond to the roots in the dual space. And then that's some formula. These Fs would be some partition function you're summing over uh, the magnetic charges. The sectors would be the same as what you'd get in the dual space for uh, summing over the electric charges. That won't concern us here. I really need only the special case of <coughs> the exponential that I wrote out first. Okay? Now, <coughs> Think about the philosophy that I enunciated in the first lecture. So you're supposed to replace uh, points in a manifold by loops on the manifold. The simplest manifold that we want to talk about is a circle. So I'm now going to take the exercise of talking about maps of a circle into a circle. The target circle will be of radius r. That's this one. And we're going to talk about, forget this for the moment, we're going to be talking about maps of a circle into this circle of radius r. That's our new manifold. So loops on a circle of radius r will be our new manifold. Set of all such maps is our new manifold. But now I remind you of the feynman cotts construction I really want to talk on this new manifold, I want to talk about the Laplacian plus potential function. And I want to talk about its eigenvalues. But it's very hard to get at directly. We could. The best thing to do is look at the heat kernel for that operator. And out of that, we can get more information than we, as much as Laplacian, or I should say the Schrodinger operator has instead. So the philosophy, or part of what I'm trying to do is, uh, for mathematicians, that there is a consistent theory here. There's a consistent story. And so what may seem unnatural is really actually very natural. So we really want to study the Laplacian plus a potential function, which is the length squared of the vector field, the derivative along a curve. We want to talk about that Schrodinger operator, we want to study its eigenvalues uh, on an appropriate Hilbert space. But it turns out that a good way of studying it is to talk about the heat kernel for that operator. And then a good way of studying that is to remember the feynman cotts formula so that what we want to do is talk about the uh, feynman cotts formula for the heat kernel and for its space. So you end up talking about maps of a circle of length t, radius t over 2 pi, with values in this space of maps of a circle into r. And that's how I come to this space of maps into a circle. This represents the loops in it, and this is represent the loops uh, evolving in time and coming back on itself. The closed loops in that space. And it takes period t to come back. So we are talking about then these two ideas of replacing the points by maps of S1 into a circle of radius r. And then we want to find the trace of v to the minus 2 pi t of this Schrodinger operator via Kahneman, Feynman, Cotts, this would be the partition function, ZTR and alpha I'll describe in a moment, uh, for that space. So we want to compute it. And that'll give us information about the eigenvalues. Well, I write down the action with a uh, coupling constant alpha prime in front for such maps. <coughs> and I briefly alluded to this in the first lecture. That action really is the Feynman-Cotts 
formula for the heat kernel for this operator if it existed in fact in this case it does exist but we won't worry about it it exists because of what you'll see that we can actually make the computation so that's the action and we can compute it because of course we can break up this big space into its components and the components being the given by two integers the winding numbers of these two circles around S1 of R. And in fact, if you have something in chi of MN, it can be represented by a winding number M and N by these explicit maps times R, which is the radius of the target, and the part that's homotopically trivial once you've got this piece which you can write as an exponential. That is, that part would have a logarithm. So the Fs are just functions of this torus, <coughs> functions on the torus. You're taking the exponential. With M and N zero, we're simply talking about those maps with winding number zero, and those have logarithms, both winding number zero. Now you compute. You can compute what's on the first line, and you can see what we're going to get as the action. And what you end up getting is this expression, where df squared means the differential of the function all squared, <coughs> integrated. That's what partial of phi with respect to x squared, the second derivative plus the Laplacian on f integrated is going to give. But this is what you get. So we can write this as pi r squared over alpha prime times the Laplacian of f inner product f plus this expression when phi is in the mn uh, component. It's a simple computation to get that far. So that tells you what the action is and now the partition function that is what's supposed to be the trace of e to the minus t times the Schrodinger operator, is integrating over all such fields phi in this space chi with weighted by that action. Note, by the way, if you looked on the previous page, r and alpha prime weren't, they occurred in this ratio, actually, in the two. So now we want to integrate this. And this is supposed to be the trace of v to the minus t Schrodinger for a circle of radius really r over the square root of alpha prime. <clears throat> so I now want to compute. It's quite straightforward. We're going to integrate over all phi. Well, they break up in the components, uh, m and n. <coughs> and then you're going to integrate phi And we write it out, and this is what we get. We'll get a piece which is common to everything. That is the homotopically trivial component. And the rest, we get a sum over mn of this expression. Now let me stop here for a moment to emphasize the similarity with what we did in the case of S-duality uh, for abelian gauge theories. Remember, I deliberately, in fact, wrote it in a way where you got a piece that only depended on the trivial line bundle, and then that was a common factor, and then the rest was a sum over C1, uh, and that was the part that really gave you a modular function with some problems about the metric that you have to solve because of the common factor. The same thing is happening here. We have a term, this part, that means this part right here, Z0 stands for the trivial component, which is common to everything, and then we have the rest which is a sum over the different components 
uh, that's just picked representatives, just like we picked harmonic representatives in the case of gate line, of abelian gauge theory. And even in this part, we're going to break it up into two parts. One is the sum where the t is in the numerator, and the other is the sum where the t is in the denominator. The n, remember, represents, I've forgotten which order, I guess the m represented uh, the actual winding of the, of the space loop around the, the target, and the n represented the winding of uh, the time circle, of period 2 pi t, uh, around the target. Now, this one I'm happy about. Remember, I'm supposed to be computing the trace of e to the minus t times the Schrodinger operator. We expect to get eigenvalues, so you should get t times eigenvalues. We expect to get that thing to look like e to the minus t lambda n for the eigenvalues, if you ordered them, sum over n. It should look like something like that. The t should be here, right? This part's fine. Here, a t is in the denominator. Now I remind you, now you see why I started off by writing down the Poisson summation formula. In that, I should have emphasized that what you do, of course, is the coefficient c in there got changed to its reciprocal. In fact, I ought to emphasize that more. Let me go back to that example if I can find it. Hmm. Oh well. Uh, in this case, if you use the Poisson summation formula, then this sum is equal to this sum. Now I'm happy. I got the t in the numerator. And I can think of this as eigenvalues. Okay? So we end up with seeing that this partition function, I should emphasize partition function is only one piece of the quantum field theory, but in this particular case, the most interesting piece, is written as the part that comes from the homotopically trivial part, which we haven't analyzed yet, times this term, e to the minus pi t, and here we have this term, which should be part of the eigenvalues that we're getting. Now we make the remark, and this is what t-duality says. <coughs> if r tilde is alpha prime over r, then this expression is the same as the expression if you just substitute for r. You get the same expression except M and N are switched. <clears throat> That's already interesting because N and M play different roles. You could think of one of them, the, the space circle wrapping in as a monopole number. That's topology. And the other, I don't know what to say. Um, it's not electric charge. But two different, two different topological things get switched by changing R into 1 over R. It's like the switching between magnetic and electric that I was trying to describe, I feel unsuccessfully last time. But at any rate, I was trying to describe. <clears throat> now, if we can show that this term is independent of R and alpha prime, then we will see that the partition function based on r and alpha prime will be the same as the partition function where the target radius is alpha prime over r. And actually, this is the same as et1 over r, but you change the coupling constant to 1 over alpha prime. That's what t-duality means in this, in this baby example, infant example, actually. That you get the same partition function. Actually, you want that the whole quantum field theory is the same, but we're only doing something we can compute 
directly. It says that the partition function based on the target circle of radius r is the same as the partition function if you based your target circle on radius alpha prime over r. That's what I meant about when you compactify, we've compactified on a circle only, that's all we got, that the volume switches to one over the volume. Okay, so all that remains is to show that this is independent of r and alpha prime. And now we're in the same position again that we were in the case of abelian uh, S-duality. We got an integral, a functional integral that is Gaussian, and now it's just got to be the right interpretation, a regularization, or definition, or what have you about what uh, you mean by Gaussian integrals. A little exercise I went through then, and I'm going to go through now. Okay, well we want to integrate over, this is the expression we're going to integrate. Here's our Gaussian, here's our quadratic term, and we're going to integrate over all uh, functions like this. One of the problems here is that there are functions which are killed by the Laplacian, namely the constants. So we want to factor those out. We can write this space we're integrating over as a product, those which are constant maps and those for which the integral uh, over the circle is zero, over the torus is zero. Now, integrating over the constant maps, so this is the same as r, would just get 2 pi r. So I'm making a definition that if I have the circle, the volume I'm talking about there is the ordinary volume, 2 pi r. The rest is the integral over these with f equal to zero, now we're going to write this in terms of, because we got the exponential map. I don't really know whether it's worth carrying all this out. I'm just doing some formal things and saying that's what I mean by the integral. Uh, we really have a map which sends f into this expression, and we want to replace d phi by df, so we need the Jacobian of the map. Uh, we compute what the Jacobian is. It's constant no matter where you are for what f, and what you get is 2 pi r times the identity map. We want to get the determinant of that. Of 2 pi r, I remind you, you're going to get it. So we have the 2 pi r that came from this term. I'm looking at this expression. We got the 2 pi r over here. Then we've got the determinant of this times the identity. Remember our convention is it's 2 pi r raised to the dimension of the vector space. It's true the vector space is infinite dimensional. We've regulated it last time. We're going to regulate it the same way. So it's going to be 2 pi r times the dimension of what? Now the functions are those with integral zero or the orthogonal complement of the constant functions. And then what's left is the integral of this box means the Laplacian, but only on functions orthogonal to one. So that there's no zero in here, this integral makes perfectly good sense. That is in the conventions I've used. So here's a quadratic integral. We know that this quadratic uh, Gaussian integral, we know this means 1 over the square root of the determinant for this expression. So we end up with 2 pi r, 2 pi r to the dimension of 1 perp, the 1 over the square root of the determinant of this operator. Then we use the device we had before that we can factor this out. If we had determinant, it would, this would be factored out by the dimension of the space. Now we have the square root minus the square root. So you'll end up with this expression 
or the partition function we want. Well, you see, the, these R's are going to cancel, even if we don't know what the determinant. Without whatever regulation you're going to use, that part's going to, going to cancel. This part doesn't depend on anything but the torus that we talked about, namely a torus, a square torus with a T and a 1. Not the target in any way. Uh, and here's what we have left. We put all that together. We can actually compute uh, what the dimension of one perp is. It's this operator to the minus s at s equals zero. I remind you, heat kernel expansions. Uh, well, I don't want to go into that technology. It turns out to be minus one. So you end up with this expression looking like that. And so finally, the part that we wanted to be independent of R and alpha prime is the expression here. And it is independent of alpha prime and R. So the final formula for ZTR alpha prime is this one. Okay. So I've really shown what I wanted to show you, although I'm going to say another word or two about it. <clears throat> Namely, I've shown you that that partition function uh, does what it should do if you replace R by alpha prime over R. You get the same partition function, and that is a reflection that these two quantum field theories are the same, at least at the level of computing the partition function. And it's not a completely trivial theory. If we were mapping into the reals, then it's a free theory. That's the part Z0. But we're mapping into a circle, and there's a little bit of topology that you have to take into account, which you do by the Poisson summation formula. That's really what I did. Okay? Now, there's one thing that's remaining here. If you look at this formula, this is supposed to be the trace of a heat kernel. It should be, a, it, it's, the whole thing should look like that. Whereas what I've got is only this part looking like that. And I've got this other factor in here, which comes from the uh, homotopically trivial piece. It also should look like this, okay? Well, I don't want to go into that. I've illustrated my point. Something like the following. You can compute this determinant on a torus. Ray and I did this when we studied uh, holomorphic torsion years ago. And uh, for tori, it comes down to the uh, Dedekind second limit formula and involves a theta function, which you can write as a product. You write that product out, and then we're taking one over the square root of a product. And when you write that out, you're going to get things of the form 1 minus e to the minus k something in the denominator, which you'll write as a sum. And if you put all that together, you will be able to write formally uh, this infinite product as things of this type. So you could actually write it out and see what the other, what the contribution of the, um, of the uh, free field theory gives you. That is the homotopically trivial stuff. And then you have to check that it really does correspond to uh, the right eigenvalues for the Schrodinger operator for the free theory. And those of you who have been studying Fox spaces should know that what you do in these matters is you just look at the one-dimensional Fox space 
you look at the operator there, and then it extends as a derivation on the symmetric products. So once you know the eigenvalues on the first Hilbert space, you can get them as symmetric products, and you write all that out, and that's what you get as the, as the Gaussian, as the uh, determinant. So I won't carry that out, but it's a nice exercise for those of you who are studying free field theory to actually do this in the case at hand. Yeah. No, but but the the actual value involves the scale as well. I mean, the value of the determinant in the second limit formula will take care of that. Okay. Now, as I told you at the beginning, I was going to do an explicit concrete. And now I'm going to start waving my hands and using buzzwords, OK? So the mathematics lecture is over. <laughs> there are five types of superstrings in R91. <coughs> the closed strings of type 2A and type 2B. We were pretty close to those closed strings uh, when at the end of my first lecture, I stringified um, the supersymmetric quantum mechanics, and I wrote down an appropriate uh, Lagrangian. Peter reminded me that that's called a spinning string. <clears throat> that was a type 2 string. And what do I mean by type 2A and type 2B? Again, I want to emphasize that what one is doing is there's supposed to be concrete operators out there that you're trying to find the feynman cotts integral formula for. The operator of great interest in this case is the analog of the Dirac operator for a manifold. You want the corresponding Dirac operator uh, plus, since you're talking about strings, so strictly speaking, we would be looking at loops on a manifold. Luckily, this manifold here is R91. And then we would like to talk about the Dirac operator plus a potential term, which is Clifford multiplication by the vector field that's natural on this space, the tangent vector to the loop. That's the Dirac Ramond operator. Purely formal if you had a curved manifold. But when you have R91, it's flat, and you have a whole technology of oscillators, annihilation, creation operators, etc., in which you can really make sense of this operator. Now, the difference between type 2A and type 2B strings is this a type 2A string. Non-chiral means you really want to look at the Hilbert space that would be all the spinners, both plus and minus, chiral, positive chirality, negative chirality spinners. You want to look at that full theory. In the type 2B string, you only want to look at those that go from uh, positive to negative spinners. But that's kind of half of the previous one, so you do it twice, plus to minus twice. And you're looking at the Hilbert space of the appropriate of that for those two appropriate operators. And those are called the closed strings of type 2A and type 2B. It's kind of a miracle from what I'm saying that they're both uh, n equal to supersymmetric. That is, they're two supersymmetries of the Lagrangian for that theory. <coughs> There's a reason I'm going through this, uh, which I'll explain shortly. <coughs> Then the third type is an open string. These are maps not of a close of a circle, but of an interval into uh, the manifold. And Chan Patton factors means that the manifold has a vector bundle on it. And you, not, you don't just have a map of the open string in, but you've chosen a vector 
in the vector bundle at the initial point, image of the initial point, and a vector at the bundle, the end point. So it looks like this <coughs> with appropriate action. Here's your open string. You've got a vector bundle. So you've chosen a vector here, and you've chosen a vector there. <coughs> Then there are two heterotic strings, they're called. Heterosis meaning a melding of two different things. And again, I'll only use some buzzwords, but I want to come back to those buzzwords in a minute. What happens in this theory is because you're mapping a torus in, or at least a two-dimensional object in that has complex structure, that the and you're in a flat space, so you can really separate out. The Hilbert space is split into holomorphic and anti-holomorphic. It's really um, the metric on the torus is of type 1, 1. So you can talk about uh, x plus t and x minus t. And these two fields move in these two different directions. The heterotic string takes what you normally do with a left-handed part and it does something different with the right-handed part. What it does different on the right-hand part goes back to the uh, affinely algebras, Katsmuri construction for uh, an affinely algebra. And so there you're talking about strings with values in a group. For the moment, could be ar any arbitrary group. That gives you a very nice right moving field theory and you merge the two together. Turns out uh, by what for us right now would be miracles, the only two groups that are allowable is rank 16 E8 cross E8 so 32. <coughs> now the excitement, being more specific now about the excitement in the last couple of years is that all these strings are kind of dual to each other. They are really related. And what's interesting <clears throat> is this fact that in three, you see the Lie algebra. You see you have a vector bundle. That means you've got the group of the bundle at the end, so it's there explicitly. In the heterotic strings, you see the Lie algebra. That's the way it was built. It was built out of the affine Lie algebra construction, and there is this group. But in these closed strings, you don't see them at all. So the interesting thing is, where is the Lie group coming from? Before I do that, I should also say that there are low energy limits. Where is it? These string theories have low energy limits. So you want to see what happens as the strings collapse to a point. <clears throat> In the type 2a, you get non-chiral supergravity. Peter, one of the discoverers of supergravity. In type 2b, you get chiral uh, supergravity in 10 dimensions. For all the other cases, you get supersymmetric Yang-Mills based on either SO32 or E8 cross E8. OK, now I'm going to tell you some of the, du so you get a feeling for some of the dualities. Okay. I'm repeating what I started this lecture with, which was that closed strings of type 2A compactified on one circle. That means that the target space is no longer R91, but I've replaced one of the Euclidean coordinates by this circle. Is T dual in type 2B compactified? on this other. Now you should feel, well, maybe that's not so surprising because I just carried out in some detail forgetting about the rest of the space. Right? 
That's what I did. There's a whole construct of, as I say, of string theory on, on our on a Minkowski space that I've just uh, forgotten about simply because, uh, by and large, the audience doesn't have the background to deal with it. But you can begin to ask questions, you see, even now. You can say, well, whatever the string theory is, here's an example of what you could just check directly. I should emphasize in this case of one, you really can ask whether that's true or not because everything makes very good sense. The part with the circles I showed you how to do, it's almost free. You break it up in the components. The parts that's not the circle is a Minkowski space and you have the annihilation creation free fox space technology to, to handle it. But you see you could ask questions like, well, um, if we look in the type 2A string for R91, then we have um, SO91 acting on that space. Let's look at the, at the part of the vector space that's massless, that the vectors in there have mass zero. Let's look at the representation of uh, SO91 you're going to get there. You'll find that in type 2A and type 2B, they're not the same representation. On the other hand, if you compactify on these circles and you reduce to um, SO81, so just restrict to SO81 on the massless sector, lo and behold, the two representations are the same. That's a, you know, that's a statement about representations that you can check in this case known before the duality, and that, that's a reflection of this duality between these two types of string theory. So I've given you the simplest example of duality, which at least you should resonate to, having gone through the exercise of the first part of the lecture. Now we get to something really uh, sophisticated. <clears throat> it's conjectured that a type 2A compactified on the Calabi-Yau. That means the target, since the Calabi-Yau is uh, real six-dimensional, what's left is R31, so that this is S-dual to a type 2B on the Calabi-Yau mirror. Now that is only a conjecture because we can't really say what these field theories mean. Check is Martin's sort of shaking his head. As a mathematician, I don't know what they mean. I was about to say, here's a conjecture which you can check out in various ways. You would check the, you would check uh, what the uh, moduli space of vacua look like for these two theories. You would check what the quantum space of vacua look like for these two theories. You might check what the low energy limit looks like for two theories. You could check various things uh, that come out from this conjecture to see whether it's true or not. So far, all checks say yes. And they're dramatic. It's not, uh, it's, you know, these are not uh, trivial statements. Well, Well, I think, actually, I think the name of the game right now is you've got a lot of conformal field theories here. You really want conformal theories in which SO something acts. So that's what you really want is a, physically. A, you could make these conjectures mathematically in various cases, but physically what you want is a conformal field theory in which there is a symmetry due to uh, SOK1. And in fact, that's one of the exciting things is that these deep brains with values in something do are new conformal field theories which have the symmetry of some SO group.
Now I'm just listing some statements uh, which physicists were surprised by and delighted by because they really only want one string theory. Yes, not T, but S. But there, uh, there are recent developments, say, over, since I've been here uh, that I haven't had a chance to look at, which Vafa and collaborators claim that you can forget S-dual, S-duality, and everything is going to come out of T-duality. I don't know what that means, actually. But that's what I read from, what I understand from the first page. Now I want to make one other comment here where you can begin to see that you could actually make a lot of computations. And that is, rather than compactify on, um, rather than compactify in a Calabi Yau, we compactified on the circle. But now suppose you took a torus. The same kind of procedures I described uh, on a, working on a torus, uh, is similar to what I did for a circle, so you could actually compute and see what the moduli spaces look like, and it's kind of surprising that in fact you find what might appear to be different kind of moduli spaces uh, are the same in cases where you can actually make the computation. <clears throat> Well, I, four and five I just listed for some kind of completeness to, so you get a flavor for them. It's six that I want to talk about for a moment. Uh, and here's what it says. Once you decide that you want to look at T-duality, it says if you look at the open bosonic string, so there's no supersymmetry, you're just looking at uh, maps of an interval into a target space, which is R24-1. Now the dimension of the space, because you're not dealing with supersymmetries, should be 26. Uh, it's R24-1 with a circle is T-dual to an op to open string with target space, this circle in R24-1, but with the endpoints of the string lying in R24-0. From what I did, that's, you should be able to do that as an exercise, actually. And by R24-0, I mean the complement to the circle in this space. Take a point in the circle. and That's called a Dirichlet brain. This sub-manifold is called a Dirichlet brain, meaning Dirichlet boundary conditions. And uh, you do get to emphasize Silvati's question, the, the new recognition is that talking about open strings with values in a submanifold that is in the space part gives you a new conformal field theory where as an, an orthogonal group will, will act. And more than that, what it does for you is give you some new topology so that you've got set theory above and beyond what you had before. What you'll have are forms which you can integrate over normal spheres to the submanifold, and that's going to give you what those numbers are going to be is going to give you new sectors. And that turns out to tell you or explain why some string theories are dual to another. A string theory that has components when you dualize, you've got to see them in the other theory. So it does, deep brains do several things for you. 
uh, even though they've been around for a bit, Joe polchinski has been talking about it for a long time. It's only in the last couple of years that one realized their importance. So I repeat the definition. <clears throat> And I've just briefly alluded to uh, <coughs> why they're important. Now the question I raised uh, earlier, <coughs> the type two strings don't exhibit the gauge group, but the other strings do. How do you construct the gauge group? Well, we can't do it here. We just don't have the machinery. So what I'm about to say is an advertisement for Martin Rocek. And uh, this is an introductory lecture to his explaining to mathematicians over the next year uh, how to do that. Uh, the critical thing is, remember, we took this into the reciprocal. When these two are equal, then you can show, uh, and Martin showed me in a very neat way, uh, that in fact, you see we were talking about maps of a circle into a circle. That would be a certain part of the affine uh, Lie group for SU2, with the circle being the maximal torus. You can actually fill that out to get the two other uh, representatives of the Lie algebra, or I should say elements of the Lie algebra, we've got the circle, so we've got its, Lie, its infinitesimal generator, H, and then we would have X plus and X minus for the other two things. You can actually construct them out of this quantum field theory. Martin showed me how to do it using conformal field theory in an elementary way, but we don't have that available to us. I actually spent all night, Martin, trying to eliminate conformal field theory and make your construction direct and see if it was simpler than the one I know. And I came away this morning deciding that conformal field theory, theory. I knew that before, but this time it really hit home. <clears throat> so I can't make that construction for you. But in fact, I bring to your attention that even uh, in the construction of the representation of the fundamental representation of affine Lie algebra, there is a very nice paper uh, by Frankel and Kotz, which makes algebraic what is the physics construction. And they show you, if you start with maps of a circle into a circle, look at the plus knowing the uh, roots for the Lie circle into a torus, it's the maximal torus, that's all you've got, plus the roots, the Dinkin diagram, you can out of that find not only the rest of the Lie algebra, but the affine Lie algebra as operators on the appropriate Hilbert space. That is what enters in the heterotic string, that out of maps of a circle into a torus, you can construct the whole thing. But the construction really comes out of vertex operators, which is part and parcel of this whole uh, development. So you can, in principle, reproduce by knowing only maps, only strings with va values in the maximal torus. Now that's really very interesting. So you get the answer to the question, how do you construct a gauge group in these simple cases by one way or another uh, the, I'll call it the frankel cutts construction, but it's really the vertex operator construction in quantum field theory. <clears throat> Actually, there's more to the story, and perhaps for me, uh, the most exciting part, <clears throat> and that is that <clears throat> one is beginning to see, or at least physicists are beginning to see, that um, in these type two 
strings, especially with compact fat and the Kalabi Yau, <coughs> you can flesh out the ADE classification of singularities by actually, actually getting the ADE groups. This is just coming into consciousness for mathematicians. But the idea is that you start, uh, you look at uh, one of these type two strings compactified in the Kalabi Yau. There's a whole family of them due to the moduli space of Kalabi Yau's. And you see what happens as you approach certain singularities in the Kalabi Yau in very special cases where spheres collapse to points and that singular point uh, is gives an a, is, can be described as an ADE classification. And in the spirit of what I've just said, the volumes of these spheres that are being collapsed to the point, the volumes are proportional to the masses of corresponding uh, elements in the Hilbert uh, vectors in the Hilbert space, fields in the Hilbert space. Those masses go to zero as you collapse the spheres. And so you're getting uh, spin one vectors or fields which are massless and they begin to give you the corresponding Lie algebra and in fact you can actually construct the Lie algebra of this Dinkin diagram from the quantum field theory. So uh, that should be very interesting for mathematicians to see that carried out in some detail. But certainly it makes the recent developments in string theory exciting. The first reason was that you saw the quantization of gravity, meaning that you saw <coughs> spin two massless particles. Now we're seeing spin one massless particles and actually gauge theories emerging out of type two strings when they're not just sitting there. You're not, you're not handed them. Okay, I had a prologue when I first started these lectures. So I think it's symmetry uh, insists that there be an epilogue as well. And let me say a few words to this. The reason I gave these lectures and stuck to elementary things, well, I stuck to elementary things. That's the only thing I know, uh, the elementary aspects of the theory. <clears throat> but uh, the reason I gave them was to um, alert young people that the interface between math and physics uh, these days is very exciting. And I think here, uh, with the background of people in physics and the background of people in mathematics, is a wonderful occasion to learn both. That's why I entitled my lectures as String Theory and Mathematics. My own motivation is it's just interesting. I just find this very interesting. There's a deeper motivation. Uh, there are connections between math and physics. They have a common feature of symmetry and, and geometry. And it could well be that what one is looking for, uh, M theory, F theory, there are various names for some way of looking at this entire subject of these different string theories as a consistent one, one real theory. It could well be that what lies behind it is just as likely mathematical as physical. And I think it's important for young people to be uh, comfortable with both subjects, even though it takes a long time. But I think there's something very deep going on, and it is some combination of uh, mathematics and physics. And it'd uh, be interesting to see how that develops. Of course, the third reason for most mathematicians is that they provide technical assistance. I mean, you want to know how a K3 can be fired, can be fibered by tori, or how a Kalabi Yau will be fired, fibered by tori with singularities. I might say, I should have said this when I talked about t-duality. I emphasize the circle because somehow in t-duality, there's always a circle might be a product of circles, but there's always a circle. And if only everything were fibered by circles or tori, then the theory would, look, would, would be very simple. It's because there are singularities in the vibration that life gets difficult, and there's a lot of interesting technical problems for mathematicians 
to get involved in. And of course, uh, the fourth reason is uh, new mathematics. This stuff is generating new mathematics. I think it's quite likely we'll see some new applications to four manifolds by some of these quantum field theories. In fact, to, uh, to startle you a bit, I think the Donaldson theory was really a remarkable uh, revolution in saying something you wouldn't expect, that if you look at the moduli space of self-dual solutions to Yang-Mills, you're out of it, you're going to build a manifold invariant. That's, that's remarkable. So remarkable that people in four manifolds keep, frankly, doing the same thing. If it's not Donaldson theory, then now it's cyberg witten theory. You still, what do you do? You still look at the classical solutions. That's a moduli space. And you're going to do things with that moduli space. There's still uh, vanishing theorems and counting, etc. cetera, uh, integrating over the moduli space. But if there's anything one has learned here is there's much more to the quantum field theory than just the moduli space. There might be aspects of the quantum field theory that also have a lot of topological information above and beyond the classical moduli space. There's the quantum moduli space. There's more to the field theory that might, so that what we have been doing since Donaldson showed us the way in 83 or 84, uh, what we've been doing is looking only at the classical moduli space and nothing more. There's a lot more going on there that ought to be looked at. And a lot of different mathematics, which I've listed here. Thank you. It's my pleasure to have such an attentive audience.